Welcome to Dale Borglum's Healing at the Edge. We are very happy to share with you Dale's profound insight and open heart. Please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dale to support this podcast. Welcome everybody. This is Dale Borglum, also called Ram Dave, at the Healing at the Edge podcast channel on the Be Here Now Network. And today I am going to be interviewing my friend Joe DiNardo. Uh, I'd also like to mention right off the bat here that this podcast channel and the network itself is supported by donations. So if you look around the website, there's a really obvious place to make a donation. And we'd sure appreciate that, of course. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Glad to be here. And uh, Joe has written a book about the death of his wife and about how that grief has affected his long-standing meditation practice. Joe, maybe you can just briefly tell us what it is that's been going on in that realm. Well, as you mentioned, I, I have been a 40-year uh, practitioner of the Vipassana meditation. Um, my wife was diagnosed in 20. 13 with stage four pancreatic cancer. Uh, she lived for two years through multiple um, uh, treatments of uh, chemotherapy and radiation. And I'm sure everybody is aware of the effects of that sort of treatment has both on the body and the spirit and the mind. Um, and, you know, I was... Uh, you know, I was able and, and was, in fact, always with her and by her side at every step of the way uh, by choice. And, um, you know, during the, the years of practice that I spent on the pillow at many retreats, you know, we often spent time talking about dealing with grief. A lot of that, however, for me was in the abstract where you bring it up in your meditation practice and you try to get in touch with it. Um, but when it actually happens in your life, when someone says to you that your wife has stage four pancreatic cancer, um, that grief becomes palpable and you don't need to work to bring it up yourself it's simply there and um you know your practice is then challenged it was challenged for me um to to see whether or not i was able to to let it be with there let it be there uh and not to try to manipulate it in any way even though i wanted to and of course, you also have the desire to try to say and or be and or do things for the person who is now dying in front of you. But I felt because of my practice, I immediately recognized that my immediate response was to try to do things that I needed to do, but not necessarily what my wife needed. Right. And I then immediately switched into, and I felt very fortunate to have had many years of sitting on the cushion that helped me in, to recognize, wait a minute, let me try to listen to what she needs to hear and what she needs from me in this process that she's now going through. Right. Um, I'm not dying at least not in the sense that she was, she was. And I had to be there for her. So um, that was the challenge for me. And, um, you know, I was, I was humbled by that challenge in some strange way since I had no choice in the matter, it was there for me. I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't choose not to have it. I couldn't choose to have it. It was simply in my life now. Um, I looked at it 
as something that I could work with and something that I could deepen my practice to levels that I might never have been able to reach or touch or taste without the impetus of this very, very palpable grief and fear of the unknown um, that I was going through uh, in watching what was unfolding for my wife. Rumi has this quote where he says, grief is the garden of compassion. And of course, a garden is a place where something beautiful or tasty or wonderful can grow. So he's implying that out of this garden of grief can grow compassion, the open heart meeting suffering. Uh, I would guess that everybody who's listening to this podcast is grieving, whether it's a deep grief as the result of the death or loss of somebody close to you lately, or just the accumulation of all the small griefs that everybody has gone through. Uh, my friend Stephen Levine, who I used to teach with, you probably know that he died last year. Yes. Uh, he talked about a reservoir of grief, that everybody has this reservoir of grief that they're carrying around. And we often work to avoid experiencing that so we can find joy and, and connection in our lives rather than go around grieving. But then something comes along like the death of your wife, and it's just not that grief, but it's all the grief that uh, you are confronted with. And uh, to me, then, that grief is a horrible but deep opportunity for healing, uh, an opportunity that I would not wish upon you or anyone. But when it's there, when that sense of uh, brokenheartedness arises, then how, how, how deeply can one use that as an opportunity to find levels of the heart that going into therapy or sitting on the cushion are probably not going to uncover? And I'm kind of curious if, if that happened for you. I would guess that it did. It did. And, and uh, having sat on the cushion for many, many hours and weeks and months, uh, I recognized immediately that it had never produced in me, I was never able to actually have this experience of grief and be so close to death as I was now um, just by sitting and or trying to go through the different practices about working with death and, and grief in your sitting practice, which is not to say that you shouldn't do it. I think the fact that I did do it gave me a, a boost and an assist here uh, when, it, when, this, when this occurred. And I like the way that you said that everyone, you know, is sitting on a reservoir of grief already, grief that we have sort of buried in some fashion, psychologically or otherwise, um, that when, when a, a, a major event occurs, it sort of opens up a rift in this reservoir and not just the grief of the moment is there, but a lot of other grief, even un unidentified grief now swarms in as well, making it even more difficult and, uh, and more overwhelming. I think that happened for me. Um, but, you know, it was, it was, I felt that my practice, my experience was that my practice was very strong and, um, um, and I, I, was, I felt honored to have the practice um, to guide me through this and give me an assist through this because it was a, a, like you said, wouldn't wish it on anybody, but when it happens to somebody, and it's going to happen to everybody at some point in time, we're going to all be confronted, if it's not with someone else's death, with our own death. Um, you need to be ready for that. We need to practice for that, I think. So I often work with people who are dying, which of course then implies that I'm often working with people who are grieving because there's a family involved. Mm -hmm. And what I encourage is conscious grief work mm -hmm. in the sense that grief is arising and it's very easy to 
get caught in the story. I'm grieving because of something happening out there. I'm grieving because of the loss of this person or uh, this particular circumstance. Is it possible to meet in a very naked and direct way the feelings themselves, to acknowledge the feelings of grief without kind of pushing away the feelings by grabbing onto the story? And maybe even creating a ritual where every day or every so many days you take a time for this conscious grief work where you're willing to invite the grief to come. Sometimes it'll come, sometimes it won't. But to be with it in, the, in this naked, intimate way, uh, in a way that really speaks to Rumi's quote of grief is the garden of compassion, that like being with grief nakedly and directly, then uh, it almost requires the heart to open. Uh, my, my sense of it is that you were talking there before about being on the cushion for so many hours and so many years that, that that meditation is difficult because the mind keeps jumping in why does the mind keep jumping in i mean when the mind isn't there when the when the mind is still meditation feels so wonderful and then all of a sudden you're thinking about what's for lunch or why is that other person making so much noise or some silly thing and my sense of it is that that all fear is fear of death and that when we're meditating uh, the ego structure starts getting scared because there's all this spaciousness. There's not, there's, there's nobody who's meditating eventually. So the ego starts thinking, thinking, thinking. And uh, so that right before thinking is fear of death in a very subtle way. And that working with grief then allows us to bring a softness, a mercy to that place that makes it hard to meditate, that, that place of the unresolved or unexamined fear, fear of death. All fear is fear of death, and fear of death equals lack of enlightenment. So that uh, when you look into somebody's eyes, when I look into somebody's eyes, you can kind of see how much they've dealt with the fear of death already. There are people go, going around who seem kind of outwardly happy and in charge of things, but if you really look, they're pushing away fear of death. They're staying on the surface. And somebody like you who's had to really confront the fact that you're going to die. It's not just that your wife died, but that means that you're going to die. Right. Right. Uh, uh, and that's not just an intellectual notion. It's something that's in your bones now. That that really changes your practice. It changes the way you can be here with me right now. Well, you know, uh, again, well, the, the meditation practice... Uh, the mindfulness practice has so many different aspects to it. So I don't want to, to sound like one particular thing has changed me in any, has been the, re the reason that I changed this way or that way. But one part of the teaching that I have found, I thought, I think I found very, very helpful. Uh, the Buddha emphasized, you know, that everything is changing moment by moment and that's easy to see on a macro level you can easily say oh yeah I see the cosmos is changing you know I can even accept that you know nature around me is changing I see that the seasons change but it becomes much more difficult when you start to look inside and you know you begin to see that you know physical sensations are changing and, uh, you know, your breath changes and that, you know, you're, if you're, you're practicing and watching, your thoughts change and your emotional mindsets change. And, you know, the, the Buddha, you know, went so far as to say that, you know, you are being reborn on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Now, to, I'm not saying everybody can buy that, that, that idea. But for me, after practicing a long time, I buy that. I get that in some <laughs> level. You know, I, I buy into that. It's a subtle thing. It's a small little thing. But it's also a big thing. And um, it makes it, 
I don't know. Somehow make it, it makes it easier to accept the things that you're saying, uh, to recognize that there may be something going on that supports that whole thing about, you know, selflessness. And, and if we, the more we let go, you know, something else is occurring very subtle and very uh, significant if we watch it and let it be, like you say, not hang on, not push it away. Um, but I think that, you know, sometimes what, you, what you're saying, what I'm saying may appeal to a, an audience that has been practicing for some period of time uh, or maybe somebody who is, you know, opened up because of some great suffering in their life. Um, you know, for some reason, after my after going through two years of of uh, my wife suffering through treatment and passing away, I, I felt the change come over me in terms of how I presented myself to the world. I'm a I'm a, I'm a trial lawyer for many years, and for the last 15 years, I've been a businessman. And I've never been afraid to say I was a Buddhist. I've never been afraid to say I was a meditator. But I I was afraid to say it, you know, everywhere. I would say it to my personal friends. They would know it because, you know, at some point in time, someone would say, well, you have all these little Buddhist things around. What's that all about? But a lot of people, trial lawyers, my friends and around the world, they wouldn't know that. But now suddenly I found myself accepting the fact that that is a major part of who I am and being feeling free to, you know, to express those thoughts and those ideas to, if it's appropriate, if it's appropriate, um, to people who I might not normally have done so before. And what I'm finding is almost everybody who is stressed out Everybody who is so tired of being inundated, you know, by their cell phone, their laptops, their, you know, their television, whatever, uh, and everything else that goes on at their jobs and so on, everybody says, wow, I'd like to try that. I've been thinking about that. I really want to try meditation too. You know, tell me more about it. So I think that as time goes by, I'm hoping that the teachings that you work with dying people and other people that the teachings that we have become so fond of don't get watered down you know a lot of people hear the teachings they sit a course for a weekend they become a teacher uh i hope that doesn't happen so much that anyways i hope that people practice a long time um and stay with the practice for a long time and study and then become maybe a teacher but people are are hungry for this now in the west and, you know, I'm finding a, that people who I never would have suspected want to know more and more about it in a genuine way in my world, which is very unusual. So what I hear you saying, let me try to put it in different words, is that even if you don't have a big loss of the death of your partner, that everybody is grieving, that we're separated from ourselves. Just like you said, everybody's carrying grief around us on some level. We're, we're separated from the people around us. We're separated from God. If you have some theistic uh, uh, worldview. And so what I see is that, that people create personality structures to avoid feeling that grief, to stay busy, to stay stressed out, to uh, not feel that sense of separation. So that, 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 once again, going back to that Rumi quote, grief is the garden of compassion. Grief is any negative emotion arising in response to feeling separate. It's not just I'm sad because my wife died, but I'm angry because the guy cut me off in traffic. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that, that's a grief reaction because you don't feel connected to self and to the, to the other driver. Uh, and compassion has the quality of feeling connected. And what we're talking about here is being willing to admit our feelings of separation and learning to transmute that separation into connectedness. Can, can one really acknowledge 
what it feels like to be separate in a, in a Vipassana or in a mindful sense without making up a story about it, without thinking about it. But what is the immediate living experience of feeling separate? The big separation, the ongoing small separations. Acknowledge that, be with that. And then the second step is having compassion for that. Can you open your heart? Can you embrace the part of yourself that's calling out for connectedness? Rather than saying, I'm tough, I'm strong, I don't want to do that, or that's overwhelming. Uh, to take this invitation that, that grief is presenting to us. And I mean, it's a, it's a, it really depends on how, how deeply we want to be free. If we really want to be free, then that feeling of separation, that feeling of grief is pointing us directly at what we need to open to in order to become free. And if we don't want to be free so much, then th that, that separation becomes a problem. And my experience is that me and almost everybody and probably you have some combination of wanting to be free and wanting it not to hurt too much along the way, <laughs> wanting to have our cake and eat it too. So uh, how much do you want to be free? How much are you willing to look at this sense of separation, this feeling of grief? And how much do you want to kind of keep it tamped down so that today isn't uh, too raw and too uh, difficult. Because really, when you walk around on the sidewalk and look at people, how many people are really there? How many people are there being with you? How many people uh, look you in the eye and you see there's a loving whole human being on the other side of those eyeballs? It's, I remember when... Uh, when Trungpa first came to Trungpa Rinpoche first came to America, he met Suzuki Roshi, who was my first meditation teacher, and and Trungpa said, "You're the first sane person I've met in America." <laughs> <laughs> so maybe his definition of sanity was was yeah. fairly uh, fairly uh, high there or something. Yeah, right. But, right. but uh, it's true that we're kind of crazy with wanting to not feel how deeply we are lost in grief moment to moment. So, you know, when I, when I, when, when someone says to me, or if I'm speaking to somebody about it, that they're interested in uh, meditating or, or dealing with their stress through meditation, uh, before we even get to any of the things that you and I have just talked about, I usually say to them, because many of them have the idea, even though they don't admit it or know it, that they know everything anyways. Okay? Um, and that's a very difficult wall to get around for them to get out of and for us to get into. Right. When they know everything already. Right. Um, so what I suggest to them, what, what I find works, is to start with asking them to suspend disbelief. Just for half an hour. Just suspend disbelief for a half Can you make that commitment to do that for just a little while? And then we'll talk about the things that you just mentioned, Dale, um, about how much do you really want to be free? How much are you really willing to look at and find out what, what it is you're really struggling with? And uh, not, I'm not going to say universally, but oftentimes that that little segue into then speaking about the practice in a language uh, that I think both of us are using in this this uh, uh, conversation, you know, can hit home a lot of times because it's practical. It's down to earth. We're not talking, you know, in a different language that you might often hear at a retreat where people speak sort of in a different you know, using different words in a different language. Well, you know, I think it's important to say very clearly that what we're talking about is not a Buddhist idea. It's it's a human idea. Human, universal. And, and uh, if I ever get time in my life, which is always there, but I keep frittering it away, apparently, I'm going to write a book, too. And it's going to be about, <laughs> it's, it's not going to be another Buddhist book about dying, but it's going to be a book that's available to Judeo-Christian people. Uh, I remember when I first got into this uh, conscious dying work, I gave my parents, who were lovely Danish Lutherans, 
Stephen Levine's book, Who Dies? And my dad read the book. And he said, I'm sure your friend is a wonderful person, but I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he and was a real, a real Lutheran. <laughs> he was, but you know, I mean, in a way that's a shame because there, there are, you know, people on the West Coast, people on the East Coast who maybe can speak this language and a whole bunch of people in the middle of the country too. Right. But the percentage of people who are... Uh, immediately turned off by anything that's non-Judeo Christian. Uh, death is universal. Grief is universal. Right. And uh, one of my teachers said that until one comes into intimate contact with death, your spiritual practice will have the quality of you being a dilettante. Mm. So wow. uh, what a beautiful quote that is. So you can meditate a lot. You can meditate till your knees fall off. And if you don't know you're going to die, then you can kind of fluff up your personality and get a better career and a better quality of partner or whatever you want, but, or maybe not quite so much stress, but in terms of the real fruit that practice can offer, it's not going to be there. On the other hand, I know a lot of people who are working on a day-to-day -day basis with people who are dying, but they don't have that inner contemplative practice. And they're being overwhelmed by the suffering that they see around them. But to bring the two together, to really know that you're going to die. In fact, in Buddhism, before one begins to practice, there are these contemplations called the four mind-turning truths. And the first one is, you're going to die, but you don't know when. Now, what could be more obvious intellectually than that? You're going to die, I'm going to die, could be tomorrow, could be the next day. But what if we didn't know that we were going to survive this podcast? What if we didn't know that we were not going to get beyond the next sentence? How would it affect the way you and I were interacting, being willing to love each other, to be vulnerable? You're talking before basically about dying into the next moment. And uh, to me, that's what meditation teaches, this ability to lovingly surrender into the next moment and the next moment and the next moment, to keep dying if you will, to keep dying. Uh, so Krishnamurti wrote a book called Freedom from the Known. It's a wonderful title. We, we hold on to the known. The Bible talks about... I know the, the book, yeah. The Bible talks about the peace that passes understanding. Do we have to stand under all this stuff in the mind, or can we die beyond that? Maybe you could just mention the, the title of your book and what it's about and uh, so that some of the listeners who are attracted to what you're saying could go out and get that book if they wanted. The book is a small little book. It's called uh, A Letter to My Wife by Joe DiNardo. You can get it on Amazon.com, or you can go to a letter to my wife dot org, uh, and the website will come up and it'll direct you on what to do. So if they're interested in getting it, they can either download it or order it on Amazon.com. Okay. And it's about the two years that uh, we spent together while she was in treatment. Uh, it's about my how I used my meditation practice throughout that period of time. It's about uh, her actual dying and the moments that led up to it and her actual, what I call her transition. And that experience for me of being so intimately close to death was just extraordinary, extraordinary. Well, thank you for sharing that. Let me, let me read a short quote here, partly in closing, from Marion Woodman, who's a wonderful Jungian, Canadian Jungian analyst. She says, the place where you are wounded, their God can enter in, is at the point of grief that we meet each other and love each other. Grief is the doorway to one's feelings. So we don't seek out grief. Grief seeks us out. <laughs> uh, there's no escaping. Uh, although the only escape then is in freedom. And so in a way, it is a horrible blessing. And uh, I really thank you for sharing what you're uh, sharing your story. 
I encourage people to take a look at your book. And uh, once again, thank you guys for coming to our podcast channel. Well, Dale, thank you very much. I genuinely appreciate the opportunity. I enjoyed it. I did too. Thanks, Joe.